Hello, boys and girls. It's when I feel like the clock, and I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to SteelFlyers.com, All Sports Network edition that's going to be continuous because that's what I am now. I am part of Steel Flyers now. I am doing live shows for Steel Flyers now. The, the website is up and going now, and, and there's going to be tons of us on it, and this is my first I guess you would say, or gift delivery into Steel Flyers. And this, I'm so excited about this. It's fantastic. The pilot? The pilot. The, the inaugural. No, that's oh, one. I like that one. I like that the one. Inaugural. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, he asked, we, when I was doing this, it was like fountain of back ideas. And I thought, you know what, man, what do we do best? We just talk about topics and what's going on. So I brought Steel on, and that's what we're going to do. And we get to do it with full flow now. No time limits, although we sort of do. But we don't need to worry about, oh, how this is a little long for YouTube, blah, blah, blah. No, we're doing straight up, and we're talking straight up stuff here. Uh, the, the real nitty-gritty of what's going on in the NHL, trying to get down in the, not dirty, but down into the basic. Like, what's really, what do we really want to say? Saying things that aren't said anywhere else. We like to call it sometimes the elephant in the room, don't we, Steel? You got it. Yeah. So this is Steel from Steel Flyers, if you don't know that already. And I don't know why you don't. Everybody should know about that right now. Right now. And uh, we've been banned. We've been doing this. We've met about, oh, now has it been six months? Has it been oh, more than months? that. More than that? More than yeah. that. Um, April. April. Okay. Yeah. We've been doing this, and from the time we started, we hit it right off, and, and uh, the, the flow was going, and everything was working. So today, we're going to be talking about some players that either have been signed or not happy about it, are not, are holding out in camp, and have been rumored for a long time to be traded. This is, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois in Columbus, who just signed a two-year deal, basically under the understanding that he's looking for to be traded. In Winnipeg, you got Lion A, who's been talking a long time, very dissatisfied with negotiations that's been going on there. And Jack Roslovich, a young player who they had high hopes for, who has now basically come out and said that contract talks are not going anywhere near the way they want he wants, so he's holding out in camp. And Barzal for the New York Islanders, their big number one center now that Tavares is gone. And uh, he's holding out from camp, not being able to sign him either. So we're going to be talking about that, that today. Um, and then we're going to get into some nitty gritty about what we think about all this and the reasons why it may be. And uh, maybe talking about a few things that may rub people the wrong way, and that's what it's all about. Because that's what we're all about. We're talking about we're not we're taking all the chains off. We're not uh, trying to make anybody happy here. We're just saying, and everything I'm saying here, I know I I may not be correct. I'm just going from my view. Steele's going from his view. What we've heard, what we've read, or whatever the case may be, and you can have your view, and that's all cool. But we're going to have a view, and we're going to say what we feel. So, we're going to try right. to give you at least an, uh, a very highly educated yes. view yes. Uh, about what we're talking about and what we're looking at. And you know, that was the whole uh, premise behind doing this. As this, that was the whole reason why bringing uh, uh, Parallel Wisdom on board here at Steel Flyers was that he talks about the elephants in the room and he talks about the things that other people don't talk about. And uh, I can't get enough of that stuff. And we thought, Hey, let's give him a show and let him just frolic about, let him bring in the Perlo copter, let him, yeah. you know, be yeah. there in the Seattle high rise and let's fly, man. Let's yeah, fly. For sure. Yes, absolutely. That's what we're doing here. Well, uh, just uh, we'll get that helicopter going, and <laughs> but okay, I got some quotes here. We're gonna get right into it. First part is 
We're gonna, I'm going to start off with Pierre-Luc Dubois because he's kind of the hot topic right now. Pierre-Luc Dubois, his, his uh, camp came out and said, and this is from, um, from Pierre Lebrun, who is a very well-known guy out there with, uh, generally when he talks, it's not really much of a rumor. Uh, but Pierre, yeah, he's a good, he, yeah, he's a good follow man. Really like, like, really like reading Pierre's stuff for sure. Yeah, Pierre Luc Dubois is not in Columbus as camp approaches and remains unsigned. And there are rumblings from a few teams around the league that Dubois may be looking for a change of scenery. Maybe wishful thinking on their part, but stay tuned for this one. This is what originally first came out. Um, now Tortorella, who is always known for a quote after some things were up in the air and everything and he just comes in and says okay i gotta i'm gonna put this this is what I, i'm gonna put this to rest i'm gonna answer your questions and co they ask him questions and coach tortorella says pierre luc dubois desire for a trade will be handled similarly in one respect to how bob bobrovsky panarin and panarin played out two seasons ago they'll confront it as a group and deal with it in the open he said so basically, he said there is a trade request. And that's what I love about Tortorella. He doesn't hide behind nothing. If you're going to be, if you're going to say something, you're going to say something. I'm putting it out there and it's going to be out there. He's different than a lot of organizations. He's not afraid of media or anything like that. And he says it straight up. So here, Dubois, um, if we're taking John Tortorella at his word, Pierre Luc Dubois has asked for a trade. For two years, and he mentions Bobrovsky and Panarin here as the reasons, uh, as people that did the similar thing. This is happening in Columbus an awful lot. Um, he, well, this is the fourth player now in three years. Well, well, you could even say Johansson had some issues as far as uh, they ended up trading him away. Nashville signed him to an eight million dollar year contract, which they've regretted ever since, by the way. Well, yes, and but Florida they, signed Bob to ten million a year. Yeah, well, Bob Roski, yeah, Bob Roski, ten million dollars a year. That one nobody was going to be signing. Right? So, How much did Panarin sign for? Eleven and a half. Right. So, but okay, let's. So I wanted to talk about that. Panarin made it clear when he was in Chicago. Uh, this is what I really love about Panarin, like about Panarin. He didn't mince his words or try to play something different or act any different. He was saying in Chicago, when Chicago traded him for Stodd and all that, that yeah. he, wanted to play, he wanted to play in New York. Yeah. He was going to play in New York, and that was it. So when Columbus made the trade for Panarin, they knew already that he wanted to play in New York. So they made the trade pretty much with the idea that we're only going to have him for the end of his contract and he's going to New York anyways. Maybe they tried to convince him otherwise, but whatever the case may be. So with that one, you can't really say anything about Columbus for that. He wanted to play in New York and that that's it. Okay. Right? Right. Okay. But now you got, I mean, you, you got multiple players now over the last couple of years since Tortorella has taken over as coaching of of Columbus Blue Jackets and you've had multiple players and I, I'm not talking about you know grinders and fourth liners and third liners you know we're talking about mm -hmm. top shelf people here okay yeah. Bobrovsky is a Vesna trophy winner okay and and some of the other folks that, that have gone in and out of, of of Columbus in the last couple of years too are no slouch players neither, right? Sure. Okay, so what is there something in the water there? Or I mean, look, you you talk constantly about how you love Tortorella and how you love the fact that he doesn't hide behind anything and he comes right out and says things and all that other stuff. But you know what? Maybe it's him. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe that message ain't flying anymore in Columbus. Okay. With Tortorella. Yeah. No, it's, it's a great point, Steve. Great point. And it certainly uh, is in the back of everybody's mind, mine, and mine included. Um, when he won a cup with Tampa Bay, 
You remember he had a fellow named Le Cavalier there. Right? And St. Louis. And St. Louis. But Le Cavalier in particular was not what you call a captain material as far as he was concerned. He was out in the media about it. He, he pushed him to the brink. There was teammates afterwards. Um, I, I don't have them on the top of well, my he head. He pushed but, him out of Tampa Bay. Yeah, well, no, what happened, he left, and then Le Cavalier went downhill, and then they traded him. After Tortorella left. Yeah, the year left, after Tortorella left. He, they, the reason why he, was as good, he, he did what he did was because Tortorella stayed on his butt the whole way. And not, there was players at the time that played with him that said Tortorella rode him, no doubt about it. There was times in that room where they thought they were going to kill each other. And Tortorella will do that. So he's probably doing something like this to Pierre-Luc Dubois. And Pierre-Luc Dubois maybe is fed up with it and says, and that's part of the reason why he doesn't want to be there. It may also be the fact that Columbus Blue Jackets are not a cap team. And Pierre-Luc Dubois has got to the point where he thinks he's a $9 million player a year for however long. And Columbus is saying, well, you know, I, you may be right, but I just simply can't afford that. We can't afford that in our salary structure because of our fan base and all of that. And this is happening simply out of money, right? That, that could very well be the reason okay, why but then, this is happening. But then they did sign him to a two-year, $5 million a year contract. They've got a lot of – they've I mean, they've got a lot of cap space. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know what I mean? So it's not like Columbus is hurting for money or anything like that. You know what I mean? But so they did give him a two year, $5 million deal. That's now, right. I, I mean, so that's their value that they've placed on him. Okay. And so it appears that Dubois does not feel that that is a correct value for his services. So he has come out and said that he would like to no longer be playing in Columbus. Okay. Now, any team now that looks at this as automatically has a price tag associated with this right off. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the long run, this might have been pretty savvy for uh, for uh, Kekalana. Yeah, for oh. the Blue Jackets to do this. You know what I mean? Because if they're asking for a trade, more than likely they're not going to get much for him. And at least this way, whoever's going to take him is going to have to eat half of his salary or whatever, however that's going to fly. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting way to look at it, right? Here's my take. Um, he's a restricted free agent, right? So yeah. pe people can offer sheet people and they talk to other teams and you know, they, let's say they talk to the Montreal Canadiens. Remember, he's Dubois here. He's French Canadian. So let's say he talked to the, he talked to the Montreal Canadiens, and the Montreal Canadiens said, you know, we'll give you eight million dollars a year for eight years. You know, right now, if you agree to it, and Dubois is going, well, I'll agree to it, but I'm pretty positive the Columbus Blue Jackets will match it, right? Or he's afraid that they're going to match it. So he's stuck in this eight. Now he's stuck in this contract with the Columbus Blue Jackets who didn't want to give him that money in the first place. And now what were the reasons why they didn't want to give him that money? First of all, either Tortorella doesn't think he's a true number one center. So he, he's saying, you know, I'd recommend you don't give him that kind of money in this small market. Second of all, maybe they can never afford anybody to get that kind of money. Whatever the money that they're offering out there, they just can't afford to give one guy that money in their head because they won't be able to have a salary structure to have enough depth on their roster to be able to put out a team. Not to mention, in two years when DeVos' contract is up, they have to sign Wierenski and Seth Jones. They're, two, they're number one and yeah. number two defensemen. Yeah, so they're thinking... They're they thinking that they're going to pay them. They, yeah, but they're not going to have a lot of cap when they got to sign him. Seth Jones is probably going to be twelve million dollars a year. Where they must be, they might be thinking we're, we want to give the money to them, and we don't, we just don't have that money for Dubois. And Dubois said so. They worked out and they said, "I'll tell you what, 
you're right. It looks like probably it's best for you and the organization that we trade you. Can you give us two years? We'll try to do it as fast as we can so we can get max return. We can find a spot that's going to give us the max return and we'll send you on your way. And we'll even try to send you somewhere where you want to go as long as it makes sense. Trying to make him happy in the sense that it makes their players happy as well to see that they care about their players. This is a very important thing when you're talking about negotiations and what you're doing. How you treat players reflects on your room and everything. Oh, yeah. it's, it's all part of that, right? You know, look, for one, here's the thing. Dubois is very young. This is only going to be his fourth year coming up, right? Um, he's got 26 playoff games. He's got eight goals and 11 assists for those 26 playoff games. He's got 158 points for his 238 or 234 uh, NHL games. Okay. Yeah. So as 158 points, that's 65 goals and 93 assists, right? And he played his first two years, he played all 82 games, right? And then last year he played 70 because that's all they played was 70. You know what I mean? So it's not like he's not available. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, he's, yeah. And, and, and so he does, he does seem like he's putting up he, he's progressively, you know, getting better. He's making more of an impact in the playoffs and, you know, things of that nature. So, I mean, you know, I just don't know if he's going to be – I think we're going to hit that syndrome where I don't think we're going to be able to find a, a suitor for him who's going to be able to pay him what he thinks he's worth. Maybe. Um, if he yeah. thinks he's worth $8 million a year, I'm not looking at numbers that say this is $8 million a year for a center. Not for your not for your second contract or your, you know what I mean. Like th this is his second contract now, right? This two year five million dollars. So that's basically your bridge deal, mm -hmm. right? So his yeah. bridge deal is two years five million. It's a small bridge. He's probably looking at guys like Aho in Carolina that got offer sheet by Montreal for eight million dollars for six years something like that, and he's saying, you know, I'm just losing money here. I think I, I – he talked to all the people that were going to offer Sheehan, right? So he heard the money that people were willing to give him, and then he comes to Columbus and say, my market is this. I know it because I just talked to all the players. Out, I talked to all the teams out there. That's how much they value me. I want you to value me with that that much, and if you don't, then I'm not signing a long-term deal with you because I want to go where I – him getting market value. That's the way he looks at it. Now, is that, here's the thing. Now, if I'm Kekalainen, I got to say to myself, is this a guy I want? Anyways. Yeah, why would you even, why would you even offer sheet? Why would you even give him a contract to sign? That doesn't make any sense to me. If you know the guy wants to leave, you know he can get more somewhere else. Why can't you try to figure out a way to trade him or something? Uh, mostly because it's he, the, the Kekalainen is looking at it is if I trade you, I'm going to have to trade you to this specific team. So the value I'm going to get yeah. in return, return is not going to be anywhere near the value of you. You are. I, I, I have you. You are a restricted free agent. I'm, he, as a general manager, I'm going to say if they offer she you, I'm going to match it. I'm going to match it for sure. No doubt about it. So, so this, is that what that is that what that contract means then that two year five million dollars that's basically saying that no matter who, what you offer we're gonna match whatever you offer whatever any other team match offers you we're gonna match it for sure but I'll tell you that what then he has to then this is what uh, Dubois has to think okay they're telling me that they can't offer me that much money because if they do. They don't think they're going to have enough depth in their roster to be able to put out a product that's going to be able to win a cup. So if, if, I, if I sign this sheet, I'm basically forced, putting myself in a situation where I'll never win a cup. Because they're telling me that right off the bat, right? So, so Luke is going, then I don't want to be here then. Because I still want to make as much money for my family as possible. And I want to do it and win a cup. 
So let, we got to work out some sort of other deal. And Kekalainen finally comes. We get you. I understand. Uh, we we um, it's unfortunate. We're going to give you two years. Um, we're going to give you two years. We'll work out a deal, and then we'll try to trade you along the way here with this two-year deal to but you're going to have to go to where we want you to go. And then you can we'll let you we'll let you talk to the manager, work out a contract before we trade it so you're making your money and you're going but you're going to have to tell go where we want you to go to. Now anybody that's going to be able to pay him that 8 million dollars will probably be able to win a cup with or think so or whatever the case may be. Now here's my take. I think Dubois is making a big mistake. By by trying to make the trade or asking for the trade or by staying in in Columbus? I think he should. I, I think personally, he's going to lose a, how many million already signing this two-year deal as it is, right? Because the, the other team was going to give him $8 million for whatever the case may be, whatever it was, right? So he let's say it's a, he's losing three, six million anyways. You telling me that he couldn't cut that in half and say, "Okay, give me a seven million dollar contract." That's Hayes, seven million dollars. Yeah, Hayes. I know, I know, but That's so now, okay, so then, well, okay, then I got a question for you. Then this way, okay, if if he says that he talked to all these teams that are valuing, they put a value on him at eight million dollars a year. Well, where are these teams, and where is this contract offer? Yeah, that's the thing. We don't know what the teams are. But they, okay, so if if he is coming to management and saying, "Hey, I talk to teams and they they say eight million dollars," well, where is this contract? Where is this value? Where is this deal? Yeah, he could just be case, calling their bluff too. <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. see, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You, you you're gonna try to tell me that other teams are offering you this. Well, who are they? Maybe we can talk Turkey with them. Who are they? Let's go. Let's, you know, what? Actually, but I, probably I don't see think, anybody lining up for that. I imagine, actually, they he would have told them who it was, and there might have been some dis trade discussions and all that, but we don't know that for sure. I mean, we're, we can only so. assume because he's from Canada that he would want to be on a Canadian team, but we can only assume that. Who knows? I mean, who yeah, knows what he, this guy wants? He you know, wants to be a winner. and ask for a trade and then sign a two-year deal for $5 million a year? That doesn't sound yeah. to me like you want a trade. Well, yeah, it does. It, it sounds like he's making a concession with the, comp the team because he has no real – that's the thing. In, in his position, he doesn't have any leverage except for to no hold out and not play. That's the only leverage he really has except for to sign the contract that somebody else is offering him, which puts him in a situation where the team has already told him, if you do that, we're not going to have enough depth, we think, to be in a Stanley Cup contender. <laughs> so he's in a bad spot that way because he's in Columbus. Now, if I'm him, probably, and this is, okay, we're going to get into, let's stop here because we're going to get into the other situations that are going on that can really shine some light on possibly what's happening with Dubois because there's a lot of other situations about Columbus and the next team we're going to talk about, Winnipeg. There's the cities themselves that are, may not be the, the the flavor of a player that is young and stuff like that. I mean, uh, let's face it. Have you ever been to Columbus, Ohio? No. I have not, but I have Okay, heard. so, okay, I, I have been to multiple cities in Ohio, okay? Right. And, yeah. and Columbus, Ohio is not on the list of cities that are, like, check boxes of cities that are destination cities for you to go to in the United States. They, they, yeah. uh, okay, you get they, me? They don't, between, they don't survive it's in off their farmland, tours. It's in between farmland. It's in between farmland and 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 coal country, and there. It's just not a hockey town. It's they don't survive on their tourism. No. <laughs> I don't care how many times you fire that freaking cannon. It doesn't matter. Look. The yeah. fact that they even can fill that building and the fact that they've been able to put together a team and be in the playoffs for the last three years says a lot about what's going on up there as far as the team. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? 
So yeah. there, the, the, it seems like the team's doing stuff right. They got a lot of cap space. They've been able to, you know, bring put enough of a product on the ice to you know, make the playoffs the last three years. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why I always tout Tortorella as one of the best coaches ever. Right. Because not quite uh, the same though with Winnipeg. Well, Winnipeg is about the same because I've been to Winnipeg. You haven't, but I have. No. Uh, but okay, uh, what I was going to say about that is. So Dubois is listening to all these. It starts his head turning. Maybe New York, rain. New York, New York, a 22-year-old kid. Is he going to want to hang out in the farms in Columbus? Or is he going to want to go to an exciting town like New York or Montreal or whatever, right? So let's leave it at that. Winnipeg Jets. They have Lion A, who has been... He's got one more year. This is a little different situation. He's got one more year in his contract, okay? And it has been all over the news now for about two years that this contract negotiations haven't been going well. Now, how odd is that, that negotiations would be in the news when you're not even close to ready to have to sign anything yet? So... Um, this has been a difficult and relatively public situation now for quite some time. Then we have Jack Roslovich, a 23-year-old first-round first pick as well, that um, put up 30 points somewhere around there in last year. Actually, no, that was the year before. Anyways, he has been um, a little less offensively than they were hoping for. But he's in contract negotiations right, negotiations right now as a restricted free agent. And things are going so sour, he's decided to not come to camp. Winnipeg has now had issues with Truba, now with uh, Lion A, with Roslovich. It seems like everybody that comes in Winnipeg have a difficult time with finding a number, as they like to say, to be able to uh, to do this. Now, now we're looking at Columbus. Okay, we're looking at Columbus. Okay, Winnipeg is the same thing as what you basically said about Columbus. It's a labor town, kind of. Uh, a farming town. Manitoba is about the flattest thing you'll ever see in your life. The the joke in in, uh, uh, in uh, Manitoba is if your dog runs away. You can wait for two days and you can still see him running away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's, that's pretty bloody flat, man. It's, All right. <laughs> it is flat, dude. When okay. you do a trip, when you do a trip from Edmonton to Ontario, if you're not driving, sedatives are, are um, require are a good request to have. It's something maybe you might want to consider when you're going through Manitoba because there's nothing. All right. Okay. So these they got to sign guys and free agents and Winnipeg is just not a hotbed by any stretch of the imagination of where anybody if you were to ask just about anybody where would you like to get drafted or go to, to play in yeah, the I NHL? guarantee you Winnipeg and Columbus are not going to be the tops on your list. Right. Right. Although there are, they have signed some players there. If you're a family person in Columbus, I hear it's absolutely fantastic. Local crime rate, uh, great place to raise a family, all of that stuff like that. But we're talking about young players. Enter Lion A. Now, there's a different dynamic in Winnipeg. Winnipeg, um, we'll go back to Truba, who they had to, they've, uh, they already had to trade. Um, I remember when he, when Trubo was playing, they had Myers there, who's now in Vancouver. And um, Trubo was a fairly young player, about 21 years old. And he was noticeably better than Myers. <laughs> and noticeably should be playing in their 3-4 spot. And they consistently played, in the, played him in the 5-6 spot, saying he has to earn his stripes, that old school way that if you're a young player, and I'm not saying I disagree or agree with any of this, but while they were doing this, contract talks were going on, and Trub was basically saying that I don't, I don't mind doing what the coach tells me to do. He was doing it straight up. He wasn't complaining in the media or anything like that. But when contract comes up, I'm a top four defenseman. 
no doubt about it. And they didn't want to pay him as a top four defenseman. They didn't want to give him a long term contract. He got he ends up getting traded to the Rangers. And here's the funny thing: when he got traded to the Rangers, they wanted a top four defenseman in return. And Truba's like, well, I must be a top four defenseman then, right? <laughs> Go pick <figure. laughs> If they want so, a top four defenseman in return, <laughs> duh. Exactly. So I want to get paid as a top four defenseman. He goes to New York and he ends up getting paid like way well, like $8 million a year for a long-term contract that has been, and it's kind of taken the shine off of Winnipeg. But here, everybody in the room is watching this. Everybody in the room is seeing all of this happen. They know what's going on. Enter Pat Lion, Pat, Mr. Lionit, who also is getting paid, play, getting played with with Lowry, who is their third line center a lot. Uh, Brian Little, who is injured, uh, trying as hard as he can, but doesn't have the guns like he used to. Wasn't getting any time with Shifley whatsoever, and the guys pot 30, 40 goal season still. And yeah. now they come into negotiations and they're like, well, you know, you're not really our top right white, white winger. So we're not. One. I'm not saying this is what's happening, but it, there would if they really thought he was a top line right winger, this guy's six, three big can boy. I, can I just can say something shot. like if he doesn't want to play in Winnipeg, uh, come on down to some. Look, I'm going to be the homer here for a second, and I'll be like, hey, look, man, you don't want to play in Winnipeg. You come down to Philly, we'll be more than happy to take you, my man. What? Well, Bring there it. Were, there's been rumors about that. Well, the yeah, but. The problem was they were wanting Sandheim in return, and that made it very difficult for the roster in the Philadelphia Flyers. And, and look at the amount of money of what his cap hit is. He's $6.25 million for this year, and he's going to be due a huge raise for his next contract because you're right. Look, I mean, his first year, 36 goals, second year, 44, 30, 28. Now, they only played short 68 games, but he had more assists uh, last year than he did goals um, for the most part. But, I mean, 64, 70, 50, 63 points. I mean, that to me sounds like number one winger. I, uh, uh, that to me sounds like seven point nine eight million dollars a year to me. <laughs> that, well, we're going to find out what the number actually is when they actually sign to whatever they sign or whatever the case may be. It's possible that Dubois and Lion are just out of the just out of their minds. They're all, they're asking for. Oh yeah, by the way, about Columbus, there was also Josh and Josh Anderson that ended yeah. up in Montreal in that Domi deal too. Uh, but he was asking for a ridiculous amount of money that uh, was then eventually given to him anyways. But. Yeah, but could you imagine, could you imagine line A playing on a line with somebody that is a good setup player or somebody that has a net front presence or somebody that can win a face off and get him that puck so he can do those one timers from the off wing? I mean, what? I'll tell you who it's I'll tell you who he looks like if he played with somebody like Bergeron in Boston. How about Pasternak? Put oh my gosh, 50, could you imagine 50, him in 50, Toronto? Or, oh, play or, with Tavares or Or uh, even or, oh, dare I say, could you imagine him in Pittsburgh? Yeah, playing with Crosby, yeah, or Malkin or whatever, right? Just him and, in Pittsburgh. Could you imagine him just playing with Shifley in Winnipeg? Yeah, if right. They were, if they were just get playing, that. <laughs> which is what his frustration is, is you why aren't you playing me with those guys? And the only answer I can see is because they don't want his numbers to go outprice them out of out of the market where they yeah, gotta trade yeah. him anyways. But yeah, he's yeah. just saying I and he's just saying you guys are ridiculous. Yeah, everybody yeah. know everybody knows what I am. Yeah. Now, here's the thing about Lion A, though, that's a little different than Dubois. Dubois is an ultimate professional dude. Never says it. You never hear a hard, 
harsh word about him, about anybody, never does anything in the room, ultimate leader, nobody says otherwise, he grew, he's growing and growing and growing, I don't believe Tortorella is a problem, I believe this is the kind of guy that can thrive under Tortorella, and is certainly not good, maybe his butt heads with him, sure, who hasn't with Tortorella, but I don't think that it's the problem there, that it's more than likely either a combination of Columbus not being my favorite place to be as a 22-year-old millionaire and not being enough of a 22-year-old millionaire. <laughs> that, All right. It could be a combination of that. Now, Lion A, on the other hand, is a little more vocal and a little more um, snarly, I guess you would say, or at least sarcastic with the media. He well, says things well, like... Well, two things he's Finnish. Okay. Right? Uh, the second thing is, second thing is, is that he's made a significantly, a significant more amount of money than Dubois has made over the last few years. Yeah, that's true. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, a little bit more money. Yeah, yeah for sure. When, yeah. It's different when you're getting paid six point two five million dollars a year, and you just sign a contract to make five million dollars a year. When the year before that, you were making way less. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm just no, saying. I'm I love him, saying. okay? I love him, but he, he has his way of being sarcastic with the media sometimes. Uh, he says things like, well, I'm here, right? So what are you asking me? Like he'll say, they asked him about it, and he says, well, I'm here, right? And then after that, he said, the stock answer, he says something I don't think about. I don't care about what's going on today. I don't worry about tomorrow. Right now I'm here, excited to play. I'm in good shape, and I'm going to, to be a new player this year, and I just want to play well. And I, I don't doubt that that is the case as well. But there has been times, like, when the media has brought it up, and he'll say things like, well, I'm not a good player, right? So he does, He uses some sarcasm, and, and, he, and he's kind of like a – comes off a little bit like a snarky kid a little bit. And in Winnipeg, that just doesn't blow over well. But uh, that aside – I, you know, and also he's not as defensively sound as Dubois is. Dubois is a great, yeah, yeah, a lunch bucket guy that you can't help but love. Lion A is a slick offensive dynamo with a bit of a snarky attitude at times. You know, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit different of a situation. And like you said, this is Winnipeg and Columbus. If I'm Lion A. I, I from from what all the things I've heard is he says he has no problems with Winnipeg, but if he again is going to be going into a restricted free agent, he's going to be talking to other teams, and then it starts to turn in the head, you know, certain teams that he might want to play for, and stuff like that. But my thing with Winnipeg and maybe with Columbus as well is how does this how what kind of culture are we building here? where you're just consistently not able to make players happy over and over and over again. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and we're not talking about, I mean, you know, look, I, I understand that Dubois is more of the lunch pill type of guy, but when you look at, when, when you look at like what's been going on, especially in Columbus, where they've had a lot of turnover, where it's not just been lunch pail guys, it's been top shelf guys, Vesna Trophy winning players and players that are signing big contracts in other places and things like that. So, yeah, Columbus is a family town and all that other stuff, but it's got to be something else, okay? And what I mean by that is this. I'm not trying to take anything away from the coach at Winnipeg, and I'm not trying to take anything away from the coach at Columbus. But it seems to me that the NHL is having a bit of a changing of the guard, okay, where the voice in the room has to be a bit of a different voice in the room. You can't yell at 22-year-old kids anymore now as a hockey player who um, – I'm just using this as an example. You can't yell at a Patrick Line and dress him down in the locker room who – this is somebody who's come up his whole career thinking he's somebody that's special and good. You know what I mean? And and not that he's not. Not that he's not worth his, his – what he's getting paid and everything like that. You know what I'm saying? But when you dress people down like that, that really – 
I'm sorry, but I don't look at a hockey team as a drill sergeant and as as a recruit type of relationship. You understand what I'm saying? I look at a hockey team as a coach is trying to coach you his system so that we can try to win a Stanley Cup. So he's going to try to put you in the best position in situational hockey based off of his system where he thinks that your talents and skills are going to be best suited for that particular situation. And I'm not a coach. I've never coached hockey. I have no freaking clue. Okay. But I'm an amateur observationist and, you know, I've watched probably well over a thousand games in my lifetime. (laughs) You know what I mean? So, uh... Okay, well, as far I can only go by what other players have said. For instance, Tortorella seems to be the main focus there. I know Paul Maurice is kind of a player's coach. He's not a guy that does yeah, but that. But that's what, that's what everybody says about Tortorella, too. Like, you but see so many guys that say they love playing under torts, and you see so many guys that say they love playing underneath Winnipeg. You know what I mean? But then, right. but, but then what – is it something in the water? Uh, with Tortorella, I've heard both. Right, they that's loved, what I mean. They they loved him and didn't love him. Right, Paul Maurice, right, right, right. Usually everybody loves Paul Maurice. I don't think coaching is the issue there. Tortorella, sure, it could be. But I'll go as far as to say, I, I don't think Tortorella is much as a hard ass as everybody says he is, uh, to tell you the honest truth. I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think he is. But he is going to challenge the heck out of you. And I just get the idea that I, I just don't think that's a problem with the ball. I think there's something else there. Now, Panarin said he was going to New York. Bobrovsky, it seemed like a financial issue. Yeah. He, it seemed like a financial issue. And Dubois, it kind of seems so as well. Um, but we'll see. Anyways. I, I still, look, the matter, here's the other underlying thing that we really haven't talked about either. Both of these guys are early 20s. And 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 both of these guys are saying that they feel that they are not being paid their worth. Now, we've seen that up and down sports all day long. Mm-hmm. OK, it doesn't matter what sport it is. It could be football. It could be baseball. It doesn't matter. You are always going to have players that are going to come out and say, well, wait a minute. Uh, this guy over here is making way more money than me and I have way better numbers than he does. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so what's the deal with that, right? And so that's what I think is the other underlying thing here that we haven't really touched on is that, you know, look, you got these young players who are now making, you know, pretty pretty decent money now suddenly, you know, and now they play a couple seasons in the NHL. And this is the one thing that I really enjoy the most about the NHL that I really disagree about with all the other leagues. In the NHL, you have to earn your money. To begin with, yeah. Yeah. When you come in, you get an ELC, and then you earn that. And then after you get that, you get your bridge deal. And then after you get your bridge deal, then you get your big contract. Because by that time, you've either proven yourself, you've made a name for yourself, you've gotten enough stats now, you know what I mean? You've got enough time under your belt, you've got enough games under your belt that you can say, yes, I am such and such, these are my numbers, this is the kind of money I'm expecting. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I, there's another aspect of this we didn't look at. We're going to look at New York Islanders with Barzal here in a minute work because Barzal is held out. And this has been an ongoing contract thing for quite a while. Uh, Barzal's holding out, not going to camp. Uh, and uh, that we'll look at Lamorello and quickly uh, and kind of add that into what's going on here. But, oh, geez, now that I talked about it, did I lose my thought? Uh, no. Oh, no. Uh, um, oh yeah, li- um, with Line A and Dubois, it's there. Oh, oh, that's what it was. You just mentioned two great coaches, Tortorella and Paul Maurice. They're up for coach of the year almost every year. Paul Maurice has won a cup, he's been in Carolina, he's been around for yeah, a long time. Yeah. He Tortorella's is, won a cup, won two, won, oh yeah, won a cup, and yeah, won a cup, and he's brought Columbus way further than they expected. Almost brought the Rangers who yeah, were yeah. to to the finals. Great. So 
does maybe it's having these coaches who are able to work with whatever you give them like they are that give these general managers a little more to, more leeway to go yeah you don't like it too bad i know i know these guys can get can do i mean paul maurice almost got a very bad defense man defense into the playoffs last year Tortorella brought him how far without after losing Panarin and Bobrovsky. And now Kekalainen can go to them and say, you know, we just lost Panarin and Bobrovsky last year and we didn't skip a beat, Doobie. So I don't know what, how high you think you are. This is the money we got. You don't like it, then that's the way it is. You know, which brings me to the next guy, Barzal. And if you want to talk about a guy who has always been and has an aura about him, almost mafia-like, about, you know, people fear, actually, I've heard people say they actually fear him. It's Lamorello. And here, this kid, Barzal's coming up asking for, I don't know, whatever he's asking for. And uh, Lamorello, now this is a totally different thing altogether, because Lamorello's done this over and over and over again. Lamorello has no problems going. That's the number. Don't like it too bad. And guess what Lamorello has? Another one of the greatest coaches of all time. <laughs> Barry Trotz. Barry Trotz there. Jeez, so these, these general managers, you can call them great general managers, and every general manager will tell you the first thing you need is a great coach. Yeah. And once you've got a great coach, You've got a lot of leverage with these players to be able to get what you want with them because you can kind of push them around a little bit. Let's face it, that's pretty much what seems to be happening here. Would you agree? I would have to agree. I mean, ownership is always going to be looked at as something that is going to try to do the best for the cheapest. And if, if they can get a player for the cheapest amount there, that's what they're going to try to do. You know what I mean? And, and, and especially when you have talent like Matthew Barzal, you know, first round draft pick coming in 23 years old, you know what I'm saying? But is lights out in talent and skill and you pay the man. Okay, because I'm here to tell you, if they don't pay the man, the New York Islanders, they, they went with Matt Martin, which, okay, that's that that's a bit of a, you know, okay, I got you, but but you need the you need this guy like like Matthew Barzal to to round out your 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 lineup and look at what he did for them in the playoffs. I mean, that's all you have. I mean, look at how well he played for them during the round robin and even look at what he did for them during the season. You know what I'm saying? He's another one of those guys that's right up there with line A and Dubois. He's 23 years old, first round draft pick. You know what I mean? Blah, 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 the whole nine yards. But like you said, he's got this mafia aura around him. You know what I'm saying? So what do you do? Yeah, well, you got to look at some of the, I mean, you just mentioned Martin. Can't find, you, you mentioned Martin. Uh, they also brought in Schneider, and they're not even saying how much they're making. It's sort of like, yeah, they got, uh, we'll, we'll sign him. We'll tell you how much it is later. Lamorello's the only one that can ever get away with that. Lamorello come out and say, yeah, we signed two guys, but we're not going to tell you how much. Yeah, right. And, then, <laughs> and the media just goes, okay, Lambs, whatever. Yeah, we're good. Because he'll just get up and walk out. He'll just be like, that's yeah, right. gone by, you know. So <laughs> it's amazing how he gets away with that. So, But Lamorella will trade Matthew Barzal. I'll tell you that right now if necessary. He will not let it go long enough. Nobody's bigger than the team. That's Lamorella's idea. Let's see, that. that's okay, though. Because it, it, it's, it's okay if you want to do that, but then <clears> – <throat> Who are you going to sell him or who are you going to trade him to? Uh, obviously, there's probably a, a, a list as long as our arm of, of people, that of teams that would be lined up to get a, a player like Matthew Barzal. You know what I'm saying? But then now you come into that, okay, so, yeah, we'd love to have you, Mr. Barzal, but uh, how much money are you going to be asking for? Yeah. Well, what's he going to be asking for? Seven? Oh, eight? Uh no, I know, again, what, what's he at? He's a restricted free agent, and uh, I believe people can 
I, I believe people can offer Sheetham. So he's he's talking out there, and here's the numbers. And Lamorello's just saying, no, I'm not doing that. That's it. I'm not doing that. So we'll give you. So now they got to work out a, a contract, and Lamorello's got his number already. And Barzell's going to be because this is the way Lamorello works. Barzell's going to be saying, "Well, how about we blah blah blah?" And Lamorello's like, "Nobody. See that on the paper? The numbers that we got? That? Yeah. That's what you're. That's what you're signing, uh, and that's it. And if anybody does offer sheet you, yes, I'm going to sign that offer sheet. Don't worry about that. And you're stuck with me for a long time." But until that happens, those are your numbers. So, you <laughs> I mean, you know, look, here's the thing, though, with the Islanders. And and this is why I think this is going to be something that's going to be very much important for them because of the Johnny Boychuk. Um, they're missing Johnny Boychuk, okay? Now, even though he's, uh, you know, a, a defenseman, um, I think that's a – a blow to the team and not having Barzal in the room. You know what I mean? Just not having him. And I think that's going to be a major blow because they're looking at him as to being what? Number one, number two center. Yeah. Number one, number one. Yeah, that's sure. what yeah, I mean. One. So one, sorry, yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. Would. They said the same thing about Tavares and they didn't skip a beat. Nope. No, they they did have Barzell and that's why Barzell. Well, maybe uh, now you trade Barzell. Hey, how look at Barzell for Dubai and a little bit of something, something. I mean, that sounds like something that uh, Barry oh, Trotz you go would, there like that. Really? Wow, Barry Trotz type of player, Dubois, Lamorello yeah, why not, type right? of player, Dubois. Barzell's probably asking for ten, eleven million, something like right up oh, there yeah. with Panarin. So. Maybe Columbus thinks, but then it, there's a whole bunch. We don't want to get too much into that stuff. But the, the thing that I find uh, uh, interesting here is seeing these kind of teams and why they consistently fight players like this. Where you got somebody in Toronto, in uh, Dubas, who just seems to give out contracts like crazy. Nylander, when he held out... For that he held out for that little while there. I thought, oh geez, he must be lowballing yeah. this guy like crazy. And then it comes out with a contract. I'm like, well, what was Nylander looking for? That's a pretty decent contract for your yeah. first contract, like you know. And uh, Matthews making eleven and a half, and they gave money like crazy, like crazy, like crazy. And now they're in a very difficult situation over there. So finding that balance of not of keeping your room strong, solid and still sticking to your fiscally fiscal responsibility for your organization is it's I was gonna say it's difficult. I don't know how difficult it is. It seems pretty difficult, but one thing is for sure, it's really fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they they also haven't signed uh uh to to Majoff. Oh, that's the guy they just got from. Oh, uh, they just got him. Okay, all right. Toronto, Timishoff, Yeah, he's not okay. going to. He's not going to be much. He's not going to. Okay, and no. you know, I was just looking at their at their prospect pool there for their their wings and their centers, and you know, yeah, nothing's jumping out at me that's going. Oh. You know, yeah, you know, like if you look at at least if you look at Winnipeg. And you look at their, you know, you look at their prospect. Cole Perfetti jumps out. You know what I mean? They're their number one pick. So, and he played really well. And and I mean, you know, the, but there's nobody that jumps out with uh, here on the Islanders in their prospect pool. All of their players are up now to the for their most part. You know what I mean? You got uh, uh, Michelle uh, Dal Cole, 24 years old. Barzell, 23, you know, he's he's a guy that's come up. They brought up, you know, some of their young guys for on defense, too. You know what I'm saying? So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, well, the Islanders are really looking at it from the perspective of they really do, have, like you said, they do have to fill out their D. This year, they're going to, they lost, uh, well, you just mentioned his name. Boychuk. Uh, Boychuk. And, uh, then they traded uh, to Colorado. Um, 
No, it'll it'll come to me. Tapes, tapes to color out. Yeah. So you know, there's a lot of things in the works there where maybe they're thinking, you know, if we give Barzell eleven million, that's a lot on our uh, that's a lot on our cap for one player. And how are we going to fill out the defense? I don't know if they're a cap team, if they're able to go to the cap. Yeah, they. Uh, the, uh, the island, the uh, New York Islanders are not a huge market either, really, right? Well, um, uh, okay. They've, they've got, they've got they're Long fans. Island. They're Long Island, okay. But they're still in New York <laughs> with my yeah, best they're, accent. They're fighting with the Rangers. They're fighting right. with a lot of people for fan base and all that kind of yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure if their ownership wants to go to the cap all the time or something like that, in which they case he could be sitting. They're all, they are under right now, but not after they sign Barzi. And then they're going to have to possibly trade somebody else away. And they've just traded a ton of people away. It's possible that Lamorello is like, okay, I got Barry Trotz, who is able to work with a deep lineup better than any coach in the league, maybe. Maybe I trade the, maybe I trade him and I get a whole bunch of players to fill some holes instead. I wouldn't put it past Lamorello to do that. Because Lamorello, look – from back in New Jersey days. Did Lamorello ever have a superstar forward? I don't remember one. Muller? Kurt Muller, maybe? Mullen? Kurt Muller? Was he there with uh was 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 he there with when Kovalchuk was there? Yes, and that was when the organization decided they want a superstar forward. It wasn't his I'm positive that wasn't his choice. And they gave Kovalchuk an outlandish contract. And I remember Even when they back did then. that. I was like, yeah. I remember when they did that, I was like, this isn't Lamorello's move. There's no way. <laughs> There's no way. But they ended up almost going to the finals that year because they had Parise yeah, and yeah. Kovalchuk and stuff like that. And, and, then, still. and then they do a very Lamorello move, and all of a sudden Kovalchuk wants to retire yeah. and go to the KHL. I'd like to know the underworkings of what all happened there in New Jersey. Something where out of that. how much money Kovalchuk got out of that, if that was planned all along. That would not put be put it Lamorello does not follow the rules, all right? So Okay. He, I'll he, trust you on he that. Never, he, he never has. He's always had he uses every angle he possibly can. Do you know what so, though? Do you know what though? Here's what's really I was very impressed with what the Islanders put on the ice last year, yeah. especially when they came back from the break. Yeah. Because during the regular season, I didn't look at them as a threat. Mm -hmm. Okay, but when they came back from the break and they were able to win and, and be able to, to go to where they were able to go with who they have, okay? And I felt that they were a team that – is just starting to put their young guys are starting to come to the fore. Some of their prospects are starting to come into the, into their own. You know what I mean? Just like Matthew Barzell is one of their prospects that's coming into his own 23 years old. Now, now he needs to get paid now. And now they're like, Oh, well, uh, uh, yeah. we, we're winning, but uh, so now they don't have the, they don't have the cupboards per se, to to drop Tavares because they had Barzell. Well, they don't really have somebody to come in that can pick up his slack if he's not on the team. You see what I'm saying? Well, that what, yeah, but you brought up a very good point. The Islanders, I remember at the beginning of the year, I said if the Islanders make the playoffs, Barry Trotz has got to get coach of the year because on paper, they were not good enough. To right, that's what I mean. But – and they came out all gung-ho, and they played Barry Trot style uh, under five goals a game every single time. Yep. But the problem was that their depth was an issue, and they were playing young players too much for the season, and they were fading down the stretch, and it looked like they were going to end up missing the playoffs. Part of that is Varlamov, who has never had stamina, has always had stamina issues. Yeah, but part of that yeah. was also they were playing Mayfield a lot higher, a lot of young guys. That, so that's what I'm saying. What if Lamorello, who has never really had an all-star forward besides Kovalchuk that he got rid of pretty quick after they brought him in, what if he's saying, 
maybe we value depth in our lineup more than in one superstar at center. So we can have some more. That's why they have. It makes sense now, though. It makes sense now. You know what I mean? Because, look, okay, Cal Clutterbuck, but he's not an A-list forward or, or, you know, offensive guy. I don't see anybody on their, on their lineup. That's a, you know, (laughs) offensive juggernaut. No, they're not. Beauvillier looks like he's going to be really good. Right. Everly is your, is your 50 point right wing. And Pajo played really well too. I think he's got some good upside big time. You know what I mean? And Um, maybe, sorry about that. Sorry. I want you brought up Pajo. I didn't mean to trample on you there. Now you've got Pajo and Brock Nelson, which can be your top two centers. It's possible he brought in Pajo knowing that he was going to have this problem with Barzal. And this was all planned all the way from the get-go. Maybe. Because Pajot's a second-line center, five yeah. million. Yeah. Uh, not Brock Nelson's now your number one, who isn't a, isn't a true number one. But we're not talking about true number ones anymore. We're talking about building a lineup that is deep all the way through instead of having one super... And this is the way Lamorello has built his and, but, and we know... We know based off of how far they made it in the playoffs that they are deep down the middle. Yeah. Well, with Barzal, they are. For sure. Right. Yeah. But if you pick up another, a lesser center for Barzal, maybe another a defenseman, and, you know, you find a way to fill out the wings with, with whatever you can fill it out because they need a defenseman, now you got a deep line, and now you got a pretty deep lineup again, and you got Barry Trotz there who can just work magic with whatever lineup you give him. Always has his whole career. He may be looking at it that. I would not be surprised at all here. I give, you know what? I'll go as far as to say that signing Barzal to me at this moment is about 50 50. For the Islanders to do it? I think it's about 50% chance they're going to trade him, 50% chance they're going to sign him. I think it's – I'm going to go the other way, man. I'm going to say 70-30. 70-30. I'm going to say 70% they're going to sign him, 30% they're going to trade him. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And the reason why I'm saying that is it's a, just a gut feeling that because of how everything came together last year, I think that they are going to want to keep that core together. And let's face facts. A team – that goes into this year that's had a lot of turnover is going to be facing some chemistry issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. At least in the first 10 games and you can't afford in a 56 game season afford to slack 10 or 15 games to where you can get your club and your team all on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. And if, the, and if the Islanders want to be where they were last year and or better, they're going to need to, to bring Barzal on board. Yeah, I think Lamorello is not just looking at this year. He's looking at the long term, too. And it's going, to compl- it's going to completely depend on how long he uh, – Lamorello is stubborn. Man. Now that he has not went to camp, Lamorello is already pissed. Okay, he's mad already. Because I'm Lamorello, what are you, what are you doing here? You know, like, you know, this is the Islanders. You're not, you're hurting my team because of a contract. You know, yeah, okay. things, things are starting to weigh in the side of Lamorello. Going, I'm not. I have my pride in this organization as well, and I'm not going to let some kid push me around. I don't care who you are. That is Lamorello in a nutshell. He'll, he'll do. Agreed. He'll do it. Agreed. So, Agreed. Can't argue with that. I mean, yeah. You, look, when when you have your name on the cup, yeah, you can't really you 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 have to respect that a little bit because no matter what anybody says or thinks during that particular point in time, you were able to put it all together, which yeah. means that the chances of you doing it again are much greater than the chances of you having gone from not doing it to actually doing it the first time. And then once you've done it, you you have a better chance of doing it again. You know what I mean? Yeah. And his mantra has always been nobody greater than the team. 
He's his mantra has always been. Like that. You know what's funny? I've been sitting here looking at, at this, and I'm looking up and down their lineup, and I'm looking at uh, the contracts for everybody. Five million, 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 and then you get to uh, Brock Anders. Nelson and 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 uh, Anders Lee, right? And they're the oddball ones, and then Clutterbuck. And and below, right, are are three five, three five, and then three, and then two, and then one. Look at who he gives us three fives to. These are his fourth line players. The New York Islanders have had the best fourth line for years. I mean, let's face it, Cal Clutterbuck, man, is the man. Well, he's he brings the pain very well. Exactly. And, and they all play very defensively. This this is a lamor. They have build. high energy too. And this is a Lamorello built team where the fourth line. Remember, we were talking about. Okay, this is going to bring up. We had. We we might as well give him a little bit of a promo too. Yeah, be there. Well, we were talking about Giroux playing for the Giroux going down to the third line and building his way back up. Oh, when when you said about having Giroux go down to the third line there in Philly in yeah. front of the team and making it sound like, yeah, we're we're putting you down on the third line and yeah, and, and he's gonna skate his way up. He's gonna skate his way up and stuff like that. That is a very Lamorello thing to do. If you're on the third line, it's as much of a honor as if you're on the first line. And that is and he pays people almost in that way. Like yeah, he pays his fourth <laughs> he fourth line players really well. Find yeah. other fourth line pairs, players that are making three and a half million dollars a year. There's not too many of them. Not there. too many of them, no. But I will say this though, you know, look, I don't, I don't think you can look at the NHL anymore now and go, um, you know, just because you're playing on a third line doesn't necessarily mean that's a demotion, or just because you're playing on the fourth line that does, to me that's not a demotion. No. You know what I'm saying? To me, those are those are just as important as the top two lines. Yeah. Okay. And that's and that's the reason why the Islanders do so well, right? Exactly. And if you can, especially if you can roll four balanced lines, where you got a good center, you got two wingers. You know what I'm saying? If you can roll four good lines, what? Yeah. You should be hoisting the cup every year. Yeah. I have really battled this back and forth in my head, and I think it's possible that if I was in their shoes, I may trade Barzo, depending on what I'm getting in return. Okay, so now let me ask you this question now. Okay, if you're going to trade him, who who, who is going to be on the – who's picking up the phone? Well, I'm going to probably do a video about that, but since you asked, I can quickly look off the top of my head and go because I haven't really thought – too much about it but i mean you could go down the list of the montreal canadians would be in there the detroit well, Red wait, now, hold on, on you have to look at teams first of all that have got cap space yeah. well you'll be able to see we're able to take money back here right so that'll help with the cap space quite a bit but detroit red wings had cap space like crazy uh the nashville predators um, maybe, but I don't think they got enough centers there as, as, as it is. We just talked about Dubois with the Columbus Blue Jackets being a Minnesota Wild might be all over it. You could get an Eck and a few players from them that would fill out, and a defenseman like Dumba. D- Dumba, Eck. That would work for, for them, sure. especially the Islanders losing Boychuk. They could use that defenseman. Yeah, they could get Eck, who is a, a Barry Trotz type player. And uh, uh, Dumba and a first round pick or something like that, so they can. Because we just mentioned they got nobody in their system, right? They they don't have any really many players coming up. Wallstrom has been a bust so far. He was a first pick, and that's about it. So I I can see it. Like just because of what you said and the way the Islanders are built, it's possible that a superstar may not be something that is a hot, completely necessary for them that they could just keep on having just four solid, solid lines that can beat you in depth. I mean, so, it got them to it got them to the Eastern Conference Finals last year. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, they beat some good teams. They, they beat a, a tough Philly team. You know what I mean? They, they, they hung on to Tampa Bay there for a while, but 
I think Tampa Bay was just too much offensively for them. You know what yeah. I mean? But yeah. uh, that's why I think that's why I think Barzal is something that they're going to need because they're going to need that offensive spark. They're going to need that creativity that he brings to the lineup. And if you trade him, who, who could you possibly get to come in cheaper than Barzal is going to be? That's going to be able to be that you're creative not, number one guy. You're not going to find. That's what gonna, I mean. You're going to have a team that has depth all the way through and is going to beat teams with their depth. That's what you're going to have if you do it. I agree. You can make a case for both sides. I'm not saying one or the other, but I can make a case for both sides is what I'm saying. Um, if you are, I mean, Toronto showed it. They paid all their guys, and now they're like, no, they have no depth in their forward depth. They did a really good job of finding ways to add to their defense this year, but their forward depth is still not great. They're paying like 700000 to old man Thornton to play. Yeah, right, <laughs> you know? with, with, with Matthews and, and you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but I, I think this is going to be a huge factor across the board for every single team involved. If there was a lot of turnover on your team, whether it was trades or no matter what, I think those teams – and especially if there's a new coach coming in as well, too. I really think those teams are going to have more of a hard time uh, in the first 10 games than, say, you know, maybe a team like – although although Boston, ha- they're going to be missing some folks. They really and, – and, and, yeah, they're going to be missing Chara, but I, I think they'll be okay without him on the team. But, I mean – They're pretty much set to go. Capitals, I think, now they did have a coaching change, but for the most part, they didn't have a lot of turnover on their team. They're pretty much the same thing, I think, with the Islanders. You know, they didn't have a lot of turnover. You know, if they can take care of Barzal and take care of the stuff that they're doing in-house, you know, I I think that they can be a much more of a contender. You know what I'm saying? So that, to me, I think is going to be the major factor moving forward is the fact that teams haven't had – it's a short camp. It's barely two weeks. There is no exhibition games other than the guys in the same jerseys. You know what I mean? So, and then you're going to be hitting the ice on the 13th or the 14th, and now these games count. Yeah, I agree. So, what do you? What does that say about the Montreal Canadiens that have changed basically their whole lineup? I'm afraid for them. I mean, they like I like what uh, the goat John says. It's they're going to be way at the top or way on the bottom, one of the two. Right. If they don't get the if they don't get everything clicking right away, they could be especially in that division. Yeah, you can be just completely left out yeah. of left field and uh, not out of. They were probably made the most changes out of anybody in the off season at a time when it probably was the least something you you really didn't want to do in such a short season where you don't yeah. have the t- training camps and practice. Right, but see, they didn't really it. know that per se going in. They didn't really know that it was going to be a shortened camp per se. I mean, they thought that maybe things were going to start sooner. Like they were going to have camp starting sooner in December, you know what I mean, and having more of a camp. Yeah, and- on the same on the same note, something needed to change there. And if it doesn't work this year, down the road, it'll probably work a lot better than the way they were going. Well, we're hoping that we have normal season, eighty-two games start in October for next season, and we don't have to worry and deal with this kind of issue uh, next year. We sure are. In fact, we don't hope at Pearl and Wisdom Industries. I am now sending pearls out to the land to kill COVID, so we will have no more COVID as of next year. It's done. Finished. See, that was quick. That was, that's a nice sentiment. See, everybody <laughs> was trying. You're getting all these things to put in people's arms and everything to kill the virus, and all you needed to do is that. That's it. Pearls. Done. Pearl, done. Pearlocopter. Bring it down. Hey, Pearl- all right. I'll put a whole bunch in the Perlocopter. There and we'll you just go. Get them to open up the bottom and just hey. down it goes hey. all over the land. And there we go. <laughs> what a great idea. Hey, this man. is the reason why you and I are partners. You come up with some fine, fine plans, my friend. And boys and girls, you just heard some of the finest pearls in the land here from Steel Flyers. The, the, the uh, leader, our, our humble leader of SteelFlyers.com. Oh, and great, um, uh, great commentator, and uh, 
Also does uh, great work with uh, Hockey Writers Inc., who we just had Jim Jackson on there a little while ago. And there's been some tweets, little, I heard a little bird saying that maybe Jim Jackson might be coming on a few more episodes down the road, possibly. Yeah, maybe we might have, we might try to get Mr. Meltzer to come back on once or twice and more. Sure. We, might, we might try to get the guys from OMB Podcast to jump on. We got to get them guys rolling in here, too. Yeah, these are some of the biggest. If you don't know who they are, Google them right now and you'll find out who they are. We are, this is big stuff we got going on here at Steel Flyers. And I'm glad you got to actually be part of the first broadcast, Pearl of Wisdom, here. Um, we're looking for exciting times. We're going to be doing this completely live eventually, but uh, this was a taped recording to show you the kind of content we're going to be bringing you here. This sort of in-depth analysis of things that are going on and uh, with an educated, well-thought-out plan and we're in, uh, of, of the ins and outs of hockey. Uh, I love, I follow it. Wait, did you it's, say educated, well-thought-out plan? Well, okay, maybe. <laughs> he's not, he's not the educated, well thought out guy. Of frolic. Yeah, that's true. Actually, it wasn't, but it's because we study and live the game, and I I, I do, I really do. I'm yeah. glad I'm able to put it to some use now. <laughs> it's exactly, I I have exactly. I've studied it my whole life. Uh, to the point where I like watch a divorce-worthy amount of hockey, <laughs> and 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 it's on the top of my mind everywhere I go, all the time. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I br- we interrupt this relationship to bring you the hockey season. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even the non-hockey season. Yeah, right. I have, yeah. I I have the most amazing wife ever. ever. Yeah. I've been divorced yeah. twice though, and I don't blame them. I would have left me too. But this I'm one's fantastic. This. Look, I'm going to say this. We are very lucky here at Steel Flyers to have somebody like you to be part of what we're trying to do here. Um, we're, we're not about rumors. We're not about um, what everybody's thinking about. And we're not trying to do hot takes per se or th- things like that. We're trying to give you the truth. We're trying to give you our best educated uh, information that we can give you about all the teams, all the NHL, all the sports. That's what this is about. That's what Steel Flyers All Sports Network is all about. It's not just about hockey. It's not just about basketball or football. It's about all sports. And this yep. guy right here, Perlo Wisdom, is one of the best hockey minds that you can ever come across. And if you're not following this guy, then you should be. Thanks, man. Yeah, that's what it's all about. That's what I love about this. And if you heard everything we just talked about right now, I we never said that this is going. This this is happening, or this person necessarily said this is a this is a uh, wealth uh, a, a person who has thought hockey their whole lives and has come up with something that may happen. And you know what? Often uh, I'm actually correct. <laughs> yeah, I'm I mean, we don't call the you the prognosticator for nothing, man. You know what I mean? That's that's why I mean, you are the prognosticator. Is... You know, I'm I'm just along for you know comic relief a little bit. It's gonna be you're gonna see a lot of predictions that come true. None of them are rumors. They are an educated, well well thought out, and okay, not well planned. Prediction. Well, it's like, it's like we talked about game. earlier when we talked about um, when we talked about the the quotes that uh, Le, uh, uh, Le, Le Pierre came out with. We're going to give yeah. you we're going to give you who the quotes going to come from, and we're going to tell you what the sources are going to be. If we don't have sources for this information, then we're not going to talk about it. And and well, that's I will tell true. you, I have no source for this. It's just, it's just what I think exactly. Yeah. Right, but if we right. don't have a source for things that we're talking about, or or if we don't have a source for the reasons why we're giving you, you know what I mean? Then we don't talk about it. We talk about things of. of Top hockey minds that, you know, like David Staples or like Jamie Baskow from Flyers Nitty Gritty or Lance Green from Flyers Nitty Gritty or um, Bill Meltzer or, you know, we, we read these kinds of folks and we, we pay attention to these kinds of writers. And then this is how we get our information because we're such hockey geeks. <laughs> that's, that's the word. Right. Hockey geek. Right. We're, we're all about the stats and all about everything else. So, you know. 
The difference between a geek and a cool person is how you apply your coolness. <laughs> I was a geek when I didn't apply it. Now I get to apply it. Maybe, maybe I might get a hint of cool in you. Maybe. It's We're maybe. spreading it on. Fit, Spread maybe. it on, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, this has been the Pearl of Wisdom Show with Steel Flyers on Steel Flyers network all sports network you'll get all more of this in this network and uh we have, we're, we're glad you come you're going to be in with us i know you're going to have a great time i'm going to have a great time we're going to be doing this once a week and uh there's going to be shows all week and all sports eventually and uh it's going to be amazing and i'm so glad to be part of it thank you steel for inviting me onto your your network and uh, thank you all. Any other way, man. Would not thank have you. any other way. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you again. That's our full 42%. Have a great day. Lots of love to you.